Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast. I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman, and this is episode 18, A Fish Out of Water. It's October 24th, 2014. Hi. So uh, we have a lot to talk about today. I know I say that every time, but this time there's a lot. <laughs> I'm just going to try to... Oh, there's just so much to tell you. Um, it's been a very adventuresome couple of weeks. So uh, I'll get right to it in just a moment. But basically, to give you a preview, we're going to talk about um, my trip. I had a week-long trip where I did a Knitting Daily TV segment and uh, taped that and then went to Rhinebeck. I've got a lovely shawl review, shawl kit review, actually, I should say. I'll show this to you in a moment. And, uh, you know, a few other odds and ends, like things I've been knitting and working on and so on. So let's get right into it. I want to thank a few people before we get started. Uh, for one thing, there were a number of people who have left iTunes reviews since the last episode, and I want to thank you for those. Uh, specifically, Turbo Knitter, Zane Laura, and Freckles and Pearls all left very nice reviews. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Always much appreciated. I also want to thank, uh, before I get into the details of my trip, I want to thank those of you who contacted me either privately or through the Ravelry group, uh, just sending me words of encouragement and well wishes. I, in my last episode, I was talking about how panicky I was, about particularly about the TV taping. And uh, a lot of you wrote to just wish me well and encourage me, and I, I really appreciate that. It, it helped a lot, actually. Um, I think, you know, just working at home and being by myself most of the time, having to go do something like that just feels like this, this is where the fish out of water thing comes from. I just feel like, oh, man, <laughs> I am so not a person who is made for TV. I don't wear makeup. I don't have manicures. I don't have nice clothes. You know, I just I don't perform necessarily well. So, yeah, it just took a lot to kind of work up for something like that. And, uh, but yeah, it all went great, as I'll talk about in a moment. So, uh, let's get right into the trip. I, um, I was gone from two Tuesdays ago until this past Tuesday, so for a whole week, and just uh, flew up to Cleveland, which is where uh, nearby the Knitting Daily TV segments or are, are, are their shows are taped. And also it's where... Uh, Shannon Oki, my former boss at Cooperative Press, lives. And um, so I stayed with her. She very nicely let me stay with her while I was there and uh, loaned me her car to drive out to the TV studio the next morning. Um, so I did that and uh, got there, you know, really early. And, you know, I was just so worried that I had not prepared enough you know, I'm kind of one of those people who tends to kind of wing it, and I knew that that wasn't a good idea for this for this thing. You know, it's just too much of a career definer and too much of a kind of a high stakes thing to just wing it. So, but I'm not really used to being super prepared, so I just wasn't sure that I had prepared enough, you know? But it turns out I had. I had prepared plenty. I had brought the right clothes. I had to go out and get new clothes because nothing I had was suitable. And it's not just me being picky. It's, number one, I work at home. So all my clothes are, these are not TV-ready clothes, right? And also they have a very specific list of what you can and can't wear because of what works on camera. So you can't wear black or red, or at least you can't predominantly wear black or red. Uh, you can't wear any white because that just blows out on, on the camera. Um, no polka dots, no stripes, no big prints. I mean, there were just no short sleeves. I mean, there were lots of requirements about what you could and could not wear. So, uh, yeah, I just had to go get new clothes. <laughs> Which was challenging, right? Because, I mean, I walk... Like, number one, I'm of a certain age where... Clothes generally tend to either look a little too matronly or a little too young. It's kind of hard to strike that balance and uh, and to get it to fit right and to get it to fit all their requirements. I mean, I basically, I was lucky I found what I did. Um, so yeah, I got there early. All my stuff seemed to be fine. 
uh, went into makeup and that was very funny because uh, the makeup artist is like, so how much, how much makeup do you normally wear? Cause she was trying to gauge, she didn't want to put too much on me in case I didn't normally wear makeup, which I was like, yeah, I normally don't wear it. So she kept it fairly minimal, which still meant total, you know, spider, spider leg eyelashes and tons of foundation and like she t used a lip brush to, you know, kind of expand my lips, which always looks so weird. I mean, it doesn't look weird on camera, but it looks so weird. Like when you're looking in the mirror, you're like, that's not even my lip. <laughs> and, oh my God, look what she did to my eyebrows. Okay, now you may not have studied my eyebrows <laughs> enough to know that this is not what my eyebrows normally look like. But normally I have, like from here across to here, that whole thing normally has hair on it. <laughs> I have thick eyebrows. And uh, she was like, would it, would it be okay with you if I gave you more of an arch? I think it'll just define your eyes better. And I mean, granted, she's right. It does define my eyes better, but yeah, she just... All right, when I pluck my eyebrows, on the rare occasions when I do, I, you know, do one hair at a time and kind of... And she was like, whack, 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 just yanking those things out. Yeah, it hurt. But now I'm a fancy lady with fancy lady eyebrows. <laughs> until they grow back in and then they will never look like that again. So she did that. And then, you know, I needed a half hour for my skin to heal. <laughs> no, I was just waiting for, they were taping other stuff and, you know, I'm just kind of waiting around for my turn. And there were all these other cool people there to talk to. Um, like one of the editors from Interweave Knits was there, Louisa DeMitt, and she was super cool. And, um, Laura Nelkin was there. She was um, promoting her, well, not directly promoting her new book, but, you know, kind of, what is her new book called? Knockout Knits, I think. And uh, she does really beautiful kind of bead and lace work. Um, so I had to talk to her a little bit. And Anne Murrow, who used to be the editor at Sockupied and I think is now the editor at Piecework. And just really cool people were there. And, um, and then it was time to tape my segment in, you know, the fake, the fake room that is the studio. And, uh, and that went really smoothly. It, we did almost the whole thing in one take and, uh, man, Vicki Howell is good. You know, like the whole production studio, the whole production crew is really good. They just keep everything really relaxed and smooth, you know, it makes you feel like, I mean, like one thing I liked was that when you're the guest, they don't want you to look at the camera. They want you to look at, at the host instead. So that turned out to be really great because it kind of helped me forget that I was, was being taped a little bit so I could act a little more natural. Um, yeah, so it all, that all went really fast. I mean, it was, I think it was 10 minutes and I was done. Um, and yeah, then we, we had to come back the next morning because somebody, unfortunately, somebody else who was supposed to tape the next day had to call in sick. Uh, so the one of the other women that I was driving out to Rhinebeck with, Andy Smith, who wrote the book Bigfoot Knits, uh, she lives nearby in Akron. So uh, we basically just stopped there early the next morning and Andy taped a last minute emergency segment for the show, which I was so impressed she was able to pull that together in, I mean, what amounted to like 12 hours she had to pull it together. Um, and I helped her knit some of her step outs because, I mean, it was just a whirlwind. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, then we, after Andy finished taping her segment, we got on the road to Rhinebeck, which was a long trip. Uh, I think it was about 10 or 11 hours of traveling. And, uh, and kind of boring, but at the same time, I live in a part of the country that doesn't really get fall colors. So it was really nice to, to just see all the beautiful leaves and, and, uh, and we re had rented a, an apartment, well, not an apartment, a house, really a townhouse in Hudson, New York, which is just a little ways up the road from Rhinebeck. Uh, there were about, there were six of us staying in the house and, uh, yeah, it's a real beautiful place uh, owned by this photographer who has a studio downstairs. So that was all lovely. 
and got up Friday to set up the cooperative press booth and, uh, you know, kind of shop for food and all of that stuff. And, um, Saturday and Sunday was the show, which was, which was really fun. Um, I got to meet some of you, which was lovely. I won't try to name everybody because that would just, my memory plus hurt feelings equals badness. Not going to do that, but it was wonderful to meet you all. And, um, yeah, it was beautiful. Saturday was a little warmer, uh, a little grayer. Um, and I spent the day at the cooperative press booth signing book, copies of my book, Kung Fu Myths, which was really fun. I got to meet, uh, it was just fun meeting, meeting people and signing books. And, uh, I had some kits with me too and sold some of those as well. Uh, the kits just had, it didn't have any art and needles in it, but it was basically all the other notions that you would need to make the nunchucks and the throwing stars. So I put in stuff like, you know, the polyfill that you would need and, the leather or hemp cord that you use to attach the nunchucks together and a crochet hook in case you don't have one and you know just stuff like that that might not necessarily like you don't have to gather it all basically um yeah so saturday was really busy it didn't feel quite as busy as as last year's rhinebeck but um people seemed to be having a really good show anyway like there was people were buying buying plenty of stuff <laughs> it's never a problem at rhinebeck um, and then, oh, and Saturday also, I went to the podcaster meetup. I was able to go for a little bit. It started raining, so I, we kind of got rained out a little bit, but, uh, got to talk to a number of people, including one, woman, one really sweet woman who came over to me and she said, I didn't think, I, I didn't want you to think that nobody recognized you. So I came over to say hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Yeah, I got to talk to some of the other podcasters too, which is always fun. Um, Sunday, I decided to just be, be a civilian at the market and just walk around, which was super fun. Um, my walked around with my friend Stephanie a little bit and my friend Ellen met her for lunch and we got to see the Leaping Llamas, which I swear, if you ever get to see something like that, that is truly hilarious. Uh, they actually had goats and sheep in the competition this year, which was so funny. In fact, there was one of the people who brought a goat to compete in the competition. It's it's basically a competition where they have an arena and they have kind of a limbo stick set up, but they start with it really low and the animal has to jump over it without knocking the stick off the posts. And, you know, basically the last animal standing is the winner. So it's mostly 4-H kids who have brought their animals and have trained them how to jump over these things. So cute. There was a little boy who could not have been older than seven who had this very young, very spirited alpaca. And the two of them were just, were just running pell-mell down the arena. <laughs> he would leap over the bar and the alpaca would leap over the bar. It was very exciting. Uh, but the funniest thing was there was a, a nun in full habit with a cashmere goat. And instead of running or trotting, as most of the other kids were doing, they walked in stately fashion down the arena and uh, the go the nun would slowly step over the bar and the goat would slowly step over the bar. It's just classic. I loved it. So really, really glad to see that. And uh, yeah, I got to, it was freezing cold that day. I was not, not well prepared for the weather. I mean, partly it was because when I was at home packing, the weather was predicted to be in the 60s and 70s, and I was thinking, okay, I'll bring like some shrugs and some long sleeve shirts, and that'll be fine. Well, guess what? The temperature, the, the forecast changed during the in while I was on the trip, so it's freezing on Sunday, or at least by my standards, freezing. And in fact, at some point, I ran into a bunch of the other podcasters from Texas, and we we're all just like in the corner with each other like oh my gosh <laughs> make it stop oh it's really funny so let's see what else I bought nothing I bought nothing which I don't know is I I think I've, I've gotten to the point where I've been knitting long enough and buying yarn long enough that the temptation to 
to get something is has diminished significantly. It's not that the stuff isn't beautiful. It's just that I know it will always be there. Like I'll always be going back. There will always be another beautiful thing. I don't, I don't need anything right now. So here's what I bought. Are you ready? I bought this shaving soap and a brush for my husband. <laughs> and this stuff is really nice. It's, um, it's made by this company called Natural Spent. Natural Specialties? Yeah, Natural Specialties. I, I need to look up where they're based, but um, the owner's name is Andrea Schnepf. And uh, they make these beautiful handmade shaving soaps. Uh, it's just like a... Here, I'll show you what it looks like on the inside. It looks kind of like a lotion. Oh, God, it smells good. Citrus basil is the scent. And you just, you know, you get the brush wet and kind of... I'm doing up here because my husband's bald. <laughs> he shaves his head. Um, so it looks really funny because he does like all around here and all up here and all up here. And he looks like like uh, Santa Claus. Yeah, he really loved it. So that's, that's uh, other than food, that is all I bought. Disappointing. I'll have other things to show you later, I promise. So yeah, very, very fun trip. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I want to tell you about uh, just lovely to see a bunch of people and um, people I had met and people I had never met before. Um, we drove back to Cleveland on Monday and then, and that was, you know, another 10 hour trip and then got up at four in the morning on Tuesday and I flew home. So, you know, for the, Basically, after 10 hours of driving and a very early start to the day on Tuesday, I was just wiped. This, the rest of this week has been almost completely useless. Uh, but yeah, really glad I went. And I will almost certainly be there next year, hopefully with, uh, with my friend Stacy from Mustache Yarns. And uh, we have plans, secret plans that I will fill you in on as they become more public. So other things to tell you about what I, um, I actually, th that was what I bought at Rhinebeck, but I wanted to show you some other things that I was given while I was at Rhinebeck, which was very nice. One of them is this bag. <laughs> I love this bag so much. I love the style of this bag. It's got these really cool hooks on it, and it's just kind of kind of rough and ready like me. Not girly. This dude knows me. Lars Rains, who is a another a fellow knitting designer, and uh, I'm helping him. I am uh, laying out his book for him and doing some other graphic design work for him. And he very sweetly bought this for me as a present just because he's nice and gave it to me there. Uh, it just cracks me up. And he got it for me because... Um, he knows that I used to be a historian of science and worked on the 19th century. So he was like, look, it's a knitting phrenology bag. So cool. And uh, speaking of bags, my friend Andy, whom I mentioned earlier, who is Knit Brit on Ravelry, gave me one of her project bags that she was selling at the show. Isn't this cute? It's a little drawstring bag with a little Chinese knot at the end. And um, just this sweet little leafy fabric on the inside and polka dots and birds on the outside. Adorbs. And uh, she is trying to decide whether to open an Etsy shop. I think she should, don't you? It's a really cute bags and really nicely constructed. Um, so she is Andy Smith, Knit Brit on all the social medias. And uh, yeah, write to her and let her know that she should open up a shop. So she very sweetly gave me that. And, um, oops. And then I ran into Stacy of Mustache Yarns and she gave me, this is actually only half of this game, but she gave me a skein of, um, oh shoot, where's the tag? Hold on, hold the phone. Well, it is her sock base. Sorry, I'm completely, I'm completely misplaced the tag at the moment. 
but it's her sock base, and this is the um, Dark Side of the Moon colorway, the one that the Yarn Harlot famously knit up on her blog. And um, poor Stacy has... I almost feel bad telling you about this because she is now dying, get this, 500 skeins of yarn because of that one post or that set of posts from the Yarn Harlot. Holy cow. So don't order this. Order other things or she may go mad. She may actually go insane. No, you can order it if you want, but I'm sure she would be grateful to have other colorways to tie up. <laughs> and speaking of which, while I was on the trip, I knit these socks from her yarn. Not quite as bright as it's appearing on the screen. Let me hold it back a little bit and see if that helps. Yeah, that's better. So this is her sport sock base, and this is her retro rainbow colorway. Six different colors, and I loved knitting with this. It's a... Uh, a really nice base. It's an 8020 superwash merino and nylon, and this is her sports sock, mustache yarns, and uh, yeah, machine washable, so very durable. Now she she does these in OCD skeins where you know you get the stripes to match up exactly, but I didn't want them to match exactly, so I specifically started. I think, I think this is the first one I knit, and I saw, okay, I started with the brown, so I counted, since there are six stripes, next time I started here, so that they would be as lopsided as possible, and I like them very much. They are for me. And, um, yeah, those were my, those were my nice gifts while I was there. Sorry, leaned on the keyboard there. And um, yeah, that was my Rhinebeck trip. Okay, let's talk about, I have a review for you this week. And, uh, and I probably, as I mentioned at the beginning, I probably will be doing reviews in every episode from now on because I'm getting a lot of requests now to, to review different things. And I really enjoy doing it and you all seem to really enjoy seeing them. So I'm going to keep doing them. And I've got some really great stuff lined up for the next couple of weeks, uh, some with giveaways, so exciting. So today we're going to be talking about the Green Gables Shawl Kit, which is actually a kit that I did the tech editing for. I tech edited the pattern. And uh, the person who does these kits, Anne Valley of Little Skein and the Big Wool, very kindly sent me one of the kits to review. And I really enjoyed working with all of the things that were in this kit and wanted to talk with you a bit about it. So all the links to all the stuff I'm going to talk about will be in the show notes as always, but here's the skinny. So what comes in the kit? So the basic idea behind uh, the kits that Little Skein in the Big Wool does are uh, all by indie dyers, designers, and makers of various sorts. So these are not, these are not cheap kits. And you should realize that, you know, these are all artisanally made products that are worth the, every penny that you're spending on them. She puts together four, four kits a year, and um, they are each, at least so far, have each been tied to a classic piece of literature. So this one is tied to Anne of Green Gables, obviously. More about that in a moment. Uh, there have been some previous ones, uh, like the last one she did was Where the Wild Things Are. Uh, so there's just, you know, a kind of nice variety of of different things. And um, and a lot of them are, I think m most of them, if not all of them, have been children's books so far, or young adult fiction of some kind. And, uh, and so she puts together kits that uh, sometimes you can include the book if you want. Um, there are read-alongs that always go along with this. And there's always yarn, a pattern, a project bag, stitch markers, and you can kind of, you can customize them in various ways, different colorways, bases, uh, different kinds of bags. You can get the bag or not. I mean, she really lets you customize this as much as you like. And, uh, and they're available for a limited time only. So she makes them available for, I think, usually about two and a half, three months, and then they're gone. And I mean gone. So you have to get them while they're available if you want them. Uh, this one is available until November 15th, so uh, you've got a little bit of time to 
to pick one up if you would like to. So there are multiple options with this particular kit. Uh, there's the most uh, extravagant one, I guess, or the one that's the most thorough is a, a kit called The Works, which includes uh, three skeins of yarn, the pattern, a project bag, a hard, a really pretty hardback copy of Anne of Green Gables, a shawl pin that is handmade, stitch markers. I mean, there's a whole package that it comes with. The one that uh, that she sent to me was kind of a, was basically the mid-range kit, which is called the Lux kit. And let me show you what was in that, and then I'll talk about more about what inspired it. So first of all is the bag, and this is what, I mean, Anne both puts together the kits and also makes these bags. And she also designs the fabric. Um, she said this fabric is um, features hand-painted watercolors by a Polish artist named, uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but I'll try my best, Agnieszka Szwiskowska, Szwiskowska, I think. Um, and then she adapted the paintings into the fabrics for the bags. So there are these gorgeous fall colors, and there's Anne in silhouette against a maple leaf. The author of the books is Canadian, so there are maple leaves everywhere. And then there are the interior fabric are these sweet laurel wreaths with quotes from the book inside. So really, really thoughtful construction from the ground up and a beautifully made bag. There are these, uh, there's a nice little hook that you can attach to a key ring or to your, to, you know, to a belt loop, um, a nicely made drawstring. So yeah, just a, a really nicely made bag. So there's that. There are a couple of skeins of yarn in each one, so you can really make a large size shawl. Uh, mine, this is really blown out, I'm sorry, on my camera. It is not this vibrant. It is a bright orange for sure, but unfortunately, as we know from Knitting Daily TV, <laughs> reds are a tricky thing to film. Uh, but it is an orange, it's called Anne with an E, and the yarn is by Leading Men Fiber Arts. And you can choose different kinds of yarn based on which kit you choose. There's one that is a, a basic wool, and this one is a superwash wool, really beautiful yarn, and I'll talk more about it in a moment. Um, so you get two skeins of the yarn, and you get, um, well, there, and so I wanted to mention there are three other colors. There's a bright moss green, they're all beautiful, a deep spruce green, and a dark kind of purplish gray are the other options. Um, you also get a link to the pattern, which I really like. I mean, you may not like that it doesn't come as a printed pattern in the box, but the nice thing about this is that if there have been any corrections to the pattern, you get the most up-to-date version of the pattern. So, in fact, this has already happened. There was one small errata that was found in the pattern, so it's already been updated. So when you go back to, when you go to print the pattern, it's the most correct version. Um, there are eight stitch markers in a sweet little tin. So let me show you those. So here's the little, woo, hello, oh dear. Okay, well, that's not showing up very well. The tin says, Dear Old World, You Are Very Lovely, which is a quote from Anna Green Gables and has some of the same print that the fabric has on it. And inside are a whole bunch of nice, you know, basic markers. And I used the green one to mark the beginning of the right side row. And then I used um, orange ones to mark other spots. And then there are some special stitch markers. There's a maple leaf. And another little laurel leaf, maybe? Ooh, stop fleeing. Yeah, so very, very pretty. This one has a little alligator clasp on it, so you could use it to mark the right side or you know whatever you want to do. So those. 
and uh, and candy. She always puts candy in her packages, which is nice. And yeah, just a, a beautifully designed kit. And they are uh, they cost anywhere from sixty to two hundred and ten dollars, depending on how much stuff you put in them. Uh, the kits are inspired by the 1908 novel Anne of Green Gables, and I know there are follow-up stories to it too, but the main one is Anne of Green Gables, which came out in 1908. It's by Lucy Maud Montgomery, and it's about a, who's a Canadian author, and it's about a girl who is an orphan, and she is sent to a house on Prince Edward Island. Um, I guess the, the family on the farm where she sent had originally requested a boy and through various miscommunications and gets sent instead. And so it's all about how she tries to fit in. See? Fish out of water. Always thinking with the theme. <laughs> Anne's just like me. It's like when I went to Knitting Daily TV, it was like I was an orphan going to Prince Edward Island. Right? Okay, it's a loose connection. Work with it. So yeah, it's inspired by a beloved novel. And in fact, uh, as part of the, the whole kit thing, one of the things that Anne of Little Skein does is that she has a read-along, watch-along with it so that you know people are kind of reading the book and watching uh, various TV and movie adaptations of the story while they knit on... Uh, both this kit or any other Anne-inspired kit. So she has a whole analog hashtag on Instagram where you can participate and win prizes and all kinds of fun things. So, um, yeah, it's the whole... She puts together a really nice package. These are great gifts to give to people. Uh, they're a wonderful way to... You know, when you just want a really nice treat for yourself uh, to get sort of a whole package that is really well constructed. Uh, the pattern is the Balsam Hollow shawl pattern. I'll show you the first page of my printout by Paula Emmons Feasley, who is the host of the Knitting Pipeline podcast and who has done a number of really beautiful small shawls for Quince and Company and, uh, and others. And um, it's a really well-written pattern. I should know. I tech edited it. She did a great job. I had very few I really didn't have to make many corrections at all. Um, and Paula said that she wanted to design something simple that suited the character and the setting of the book. And I think she really succeeded. So let me show you the shawl in some more detail. And I, and I should say at the outset, I made some modifications to this. So I will talk about those in a moment. But this is the basic idea. Um, the shawl is a a garter stitch triangular shawl, you know, a pretty simple construction, and has this very nice uh, leaf lace detail at the edge, which also is a nice reflection of the setting. And um, and one of the things that Paula mentions in her introduction to the pattern is that, you know, Anne is a, um, not, not a simple girl, but it's a she is, she's not fancy, you know, she, this is the kind of shawl that she would wear, is basically the point that Paul is trying to make. And, um, it needs to be practical, uh, pretty but practical, and I think she really pulled that off. Um, Balsam Hollow, which the pattern is named for, is, uh, I guess the, the forested trail on Prince Edward Island that inspired Lucy Maud Montgomery when she was writing the book, so that's why the pattern has that name. Um, I think the leaves and the color choices for the pattern are, are perfectly chosen. The yarn is, uh, as I said, Leading Men Fiber Arts. It's their callback base. And uh, you can choose from four different colors, as I mentioned before. This is the Anne with an E colorway. One of the yarn options, the one that I used, is a 100% superwash merino. It's a sport weight. It uh, has 328 yards in a 100 gram skein. So it is plenty. You get two skeins, so you have about 650 yards. You have plenty for... There are two different sizes in the pattern. There's a smaller one and a larger one. You have plenty for both. Um, it's great for a shawl, this yarn. It has just the right amount of twist so that the lace 
still pots, but you still get some squishiness. And in fact, I think this yarn would be great for lots of different things. Anything next to the skin, it's would be good for cowls, scarves, hats, sweaters, baby things, mitts. I mean, really everything except for socks, because there's no nylon in it, so uh, they wouldn't last very long as socks. But this is a great yarn for lots of other kinds of projects. Um, since it's superwash, you want to be careful when you're blocking because superwash, if you've ever worked with superwash before, you know that it can really just expand and flop when you wash it. So either steam block it uh, after you've given it a machine wash and tumble dry, or um, if you do decide to hand wash it and block it wet, uh, make sure to not let it stretch out too much. Like when you pick it up out of the water, don't, you know, pick it up by one corner, actually pick it up in a ball and, um, you know, and don't, don't stretch it out too much when you're, when you're blocking it. Um, but yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed knitting this. I found it went quite quickly. I found the lace pattern was, um, not memorizable exactly, but you could certainly see where you were. And once you reminded yourself, oh, okay, on this row, I basically need to do this. It was pretty easy to see if you've done some lace before, you can just kind of go across a whole row without having to look at the chart. So I found it very, very easy knitting. Um, I did make some modifications, as I said, and, um, but not because I didn't like the way the pattern was written, but just because I wanted I wanted to use up as much of the yarn as possible, and I also wanted my shawl to be bigger because I like tiny shawlettes on me just look like fat man in a yellow suit. <laughs> yellow suit? Little suit. What is that Chris Farley? You know the Chris Farley thing from Saturday Night Live? Fat man in a little suit. Yeah, me in a shawlette just looks stupid. So I do bigger shawls. Anyway. I did my gauge a little looser. That was kind of by accident, but I just, I started with a needle that gave me the right gauge. I thought it was a little dense for a shawl that I, like a drapey shawl, drapey. And uh, so I just used a bigger needle and I got a slightly looser gauge and that's fine. Um, I added four extra repeats. So the repeat on the shawl is 12 stitches wide. I added four repeats. So I added 48 stitches to the width of the shawl. So it made it significantly bigger um, because the the gauge is like four and three quarters stitches per inch. So I added, I added quite a bit of width onto it. Um, yeah, I just wanted to use, I knew that, I knew from doing the tech editing that even the larger size shawl in the pattern would not use up most of that second skein so I wanted to and if you do decide to get this kit I'll tell you that with that I did the smaller version of the shawl so I only did two I only did the two lace repeats you'll see what I mean if you get the pattern I did the smaller version of the shawl but I added those four repeats and what I ended up with is a ball that is uh, 17 grams in weight. Where is that little ball? Oh, here it is. So that's what I had left. Plenty so that I wasn't sweating it, but also, you know, like I felt like I really used up a good chunk of the yarn. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, this is a, like I say, a lovely, a lovely kit, really well designed. I know it's been said in podcast reviews before, but Anne Valley really knows how to put together a kit. These are like I say, not inexpensive kits, but they are well worth every penny. Everything in here is hand-designed, unique, and beautiful. So they are well worth, well worth the money. Um, yeah, I will put links in the show notes to information about the kits and, uh, and to the analog. And I hope you will enjoy participating in it. Even if you don't get the kit, the analog is a fun thing to participate in if you're a fan of the books. So thank you to Little Skin and the Big Wolf for sending this to me to review. I really appreciate it. Uh, last thing for today is I wanted to show you a technique 
And this is actually inspired both by the Knitting Daily TV segment that I did. Actually, I'm going to keep wearing this because it is a little, little tiny bit chilly. So this is both a, a technique that was inspired by the Knitting Daily TV taping that I did and also by a, uh, a viewer question. So somebody posted, well, it wasn't somebody, it was Sarah Monty, posted in the Ravelry group uh, wanting to know about how to sew in zippers. And I thought, well, that's perfect timing because I just did a tutorial on this and I will be happy to repeat it again for you. Um, oh, and I also wanted to follow up before I get into that. Somebody asked from last week, let me, instead of just continuing to say somebody, let me see who that was. It was on our RAV group and, um, and she was asking about, you know, why do people make center pole balls? Uh, oh, it might have been Sarah. Yeah, okay, it was still Sarah. The same post by Sarah Monty. So she was asking about my technique video from last time. Why do people make center pole balls? Because, you know, she's like, I just hand wind balls of yarn and then I just happily, you know, unspool from the outside of the ball. Like, why, do, why would you want to do it any differently than that? So, great question. And in fact, if you're happy doing it that way, there is nothing wrong with it. By all means, continue to do that. But I can tell you there are a few reasons why a lot of people like central pull balls or those yarn cakes that you can make by using a swift and ball winder. Uh, one of the main reasons is that when you pull from the center, the ball is less likely to be rolling around all over the floor. Uh, especially if you're hand winding a ball that's round, if you're pulling from the outside, the ball is flopping all over the place. You can use a yarn bowl to prevent that from happening, but uh, if you're pulling from the center, the thing's staying in place for the most part. Um, I think people also like it because, uh, honestly, I think it's an aesthetic thing. Like it's, they're just pretty. It's pretty having the yarn pulling from the center. Honestly, I think it's just as simple as that. Uh, with some yarns, you actually don't want to do center pull, uh, particularly if it's a very slippery yarn. Pulling from the center can just make the whole thing collapse in on itself. And I know that some yarns that have a light twist on them, like uh, thinking specifically of, oh, the Zauberball ones, the, the Zauberball sock yarns, they specifically tell you not to do a center pull ball with those because I think the the plies come untwisted if you do it that way. So, um, yeah, there are times to do it and there are times not to do it. And honestly, it's just a personal choice. So sewing a zipper in. I have now dropped my little demo bag on the floor. So let me grab it. Hold on. Et voila. All right, so this is the the sample that I brought with me, or the step outs that I brought with me up to Knitting Daily. And what I demonstrated was, I'm not going to really go through the whole thing of showing you how to sew this in, but uh, I did want to show you a few things. Sewing in zippers tends to give people agita, agita for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it can be a little tricky, and there are lots of ways to do this, but the, the thing I was demonstrating was what I consider to be really the simplest way to sew in a zipper. So first of all, depending on the kind of project you're making, you will either need a separating zipper, which you would use on something like a cardigan, so you need the zipper to actually separate at the bottom, or in this case, you need a non-separating zipper, one that doesn't come apart at the bottom, because in this backpack, this is the backpack from Kung Fu Knits. Um, you don't need the zipper to come apart at the bottom. First tip of sewing in zippers, buy the zipper after you finish knitting and blocking the piece because then you will know exactly how long a zipper you need. Uh, zippers come in increments of two inches usually. So um, if yours is a little longer, your cardigan, for example, by the, by the zipper after you're done knitting and blocking. The next thing you do is pin it in to your project. And what I did, I actually did this mainly so this would be easier to travel with, but now I really like it. I safety pinned in my zipper. I used to use uh, sewing pins, 
But I did this because I thought, well, I got to pack this up and put it in a suitcase and I don't want to get poked by it or have the pins come out. And now I'm thinking, why don't I always do this? I'm going to always do this from now on. Uh, because then you don't get poked by the pins and they won't come out until you want them to. But you just pin them in. And, uh, and the best way to do that is to, because here's the trick, right? Is that the zipper fabric is not stretchy. Knitting fabric is. So you're going to have to ease it in. So the way I do that is I start at the top. I pin there, you know, to where the top of the zipper is supposed to be. I pin the bottom of the zipper into where that's supposed to be. And then I pin the center. And then I just keep easing it in by, you know, pinning the center between the top and the center, pinning between the center and the bottom, and continuing to, you know, split the difference until the pins are about two inches apart from each other. And I do the same on the other side with the zipper unzipped. And then I just take, uh, I use a specific kind of thread to sew in the zipper. My favorite thing to use is this stuff. Transparent nylon thread. Is that like an, ah, it's not in focus. Uh, it's polyester. It's transparent. So the cool thing is that your zipper and your yarn and your thread don't have to match. This just disappears. It's a little tricky to work with because since it's transparent, it's kind of, it can be a little hard to see. So I always do this in natural light or really good lighting. Um, if you have a hard time seeing, this may not be a good option for you. Uh, but I think it's, it's fantastic. And then literally all I do is I just put it on a sharp sewing needle, tie a knot in the bottom of the thread, and then just start basting. Just do a basic basting stitch. Fairly small stitches, but it doesn't have to be super fine or anything, not like a sewing machine. And then just baste all the way up the center. If it's a if it's a pretty narrow strip of fabric. If this was a wider zipper, I would sew up one side and down the other. But this is a fairly narrow strip, so I would just do one row of stitches all the way up. And, uh, and that's it. The reason I like the basting stitch is because if you if you're a little off in your sewing, the zipper can adjust, can kind of slide around a little bit and adjust into its natural shape. So really, really simple. I try to keep it simple because otherwise stuff just sits in a bag and never gets finished. Am I right? And I think I think that is it for today, my dears. I gotta go do some other stuff. <laughs> uh, you may have noticed that I am no longer doing all the fancy, well, not that I had that much fancy, but the little fancy stuff at the beginning and the end of the podcast. I, find, I found that when I did that stuff in iMovie, that it was, that upped the chances that uh, the audio and the video got out of sync. And I just don't think it's worth it. I don't want to pull my hair out trying to edit this podcast. I would rather just get the episode out to you. So with that said, you can find me online at darkmatternits.com and I am darkmatternits on all the social medias. I will see you in a couple of weeks, my dears. Take care.